So diligent and meticulous was Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal in collecting and recording the Sunnah of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that his collection of hadith, Musnad Ahmed, is one of the largest such books there is. So learned a jurist was he that he became the eponymous founder of the Hanbali Madhab, one of the four surviving schools of Sunni jurisprudence. And so steadfast was he in his defense of Islamic orthodoxy that he earned the title the Imam of the Sunnah. Although, if one is to believe Sam Harris's friend, Majid Nawaz, it was not the Imam, Ahmed bin Hanbal, but one Abul Hassan al-Ashari, who wasn't even born yet, who brought ruin to the Mutazilite project. I want to ask you about this, because my understanding is that basically all, quote, moderate Muslims are nevertheless fundamentalists by the Christian standard, because they believe the Quran to be the literal and inerrant word of God. In Muslim history, there have been people known as the Mu'tazila who didn't insist that the Qur'an was the eternal word of God. The Mu'tazila became quite prominent until, as always, power determined which doctrine won. Usually, this happens for political reasons, not because of the strength of the arguments. Political decisions made by empires can determine and have determined which doctrines become orthodoxy. So it was with Islam. Part of the history of Muslim doctrine being shaped by power lies in the story of the Muslim dispute over whether the Qur'an was created by God or is his eternal word. I refer to this dispute not to take one view or another. I won't take theological stances here, but to highlight the variety in traditional Islamic theology on questions such as this. Having the ruling doctrine at one stage, the Mu'tazila were eventually defeated by the Ash'ara led by Imam Ash'ari whose views on the eternal, uncreated nature of the Qur'an then became accepted as orthodoxy. Imam Ash'ari was, in fact, a defector from the Mu'tazila, which shows how popular the Mu'tazila view once was. This is why most Muslims today believe that the Qur'an is the eternal, literal word of God. I don't know what's worse, rubbing the heroic Imam Ahmed out of his greatest triumph by redacting him out of history, or suggesting that Mutazilitism was anything but a top-down imposition upon an unhappy Ummah. Nawaz is claiming that the Mutazilites didn't insist that the Qur'an was the eternal word of God, is pure Orwellian doublespeak, and really betrays the bias of a person claiming not to have one. Firstly, no one would have needed to insist on believing the Qur'an to be the eternal word of God, as that was, is, and always will remain the default normative Muslim position. Secondly, what the Mutazilites did insist upon was that Muslims disbelieve in the uncreatedness of the Qur'an. That is, they made mainstream Muslim belief a thought crime and a crime to be policed with violence, intimidation and incarceration. This was the geographic and ancestral home of de Babylon, after all. In what would likely be seen by his detractors as an attempt to avoid answering a straight question, When asked by his ex-Muslim friends if he himself believes the Qur'an to be the word of God, Nawaz defers back to his errant script, rendering the history of Ahmed bin Hanbal and his pivotal role in withstanding the Mutazilite assault on Islamic orthodoxy conspicuous by its absence. You agree that this is the word of God? Do you agree with that? The the Qur'an. I mean, that's that's actually in my in my dialogue with Sam. I actually make it very clear that even that isn't agreed. That's disputed. The only reason most Muslims today insist it's the literal word of God is because the Mu'tazila lost the argument against the Ashara, and so that became doctrine because of um, the caliphs adopting for political expediency one particular reading of scripture, just like the Council of Nicaea with Christianity when the Romans decided to adopt an official state religion. The same will happen with the Ashari doctrine. But Mu'tazilites were just a minor group that just got wiped out very fast, right? Like, no, and that's they incorrect, were, historically. But, that's, an, that's a historic inaccuracy. They were a massive group until they got wiped out. Do you know that the also, man who wiped them out? I think, I think Shia, the Shia came out of the Mu'tazilites historically. Yeah, in fact, Armin, do you know Ash'ari himself? And Ash'arism is, is what became the majority doctrine, uh, and it still reigns mm-hmm. today. And Maturidi uh, views come from a branch of the Ash'ari views. Ash'arism today... And, and it's what prevailed, was born of Mu'tazilism. Imam Ashari was himself a student of the Mu'tazilis. He was a Mu'tazili himself, and then he rebelled against them. So, so prior you, to so Imam Ashari, hold on, prior to the Imam, uh, prior to the Ashari's, prior to Imam Ashari rebelling against the Mu'tazila, the Mu'tazila were the established doctrine. 
So as Islam is today, you're saying it's possible for us to have an Islam where it doesn't consider the Quran as the direct word of God. Did it happen in the past? Yes, it did. Do please hit pause and take a moment to take in the timeline. Of the main takeaways is that the Mutazilites reigned for a mere 34 out of the 1440 plus years of Islamic history so far. They did briefly pop up here and there over the course of a couple of centuries, but for the most part, they were done with in a single generation. To put it in perspective, Sam Harris has had armpit hair for longer than the Mutazilites lauded over the Ummah. Hardly the case, they were a massive group, as Nawaz wants you to believe. Still, Harris's friend was correct in one aspect, Ashirism was and is a thing born of Mutazilitism. And yes, for the worst part of the first 40 years of his life, Al-Ashari had been a staunch Mutazilite. But even here Nawaz draws the wrong conclusion, claiming that Al-Ashari's Mutazilite past shows how popular the Mu'tazila view once was. Uh, no it doesn't. For much of his own youth, Nawaz was himself a cheerleader for the impotent Hizbut Tahrir. How popular or representative is that group with British Muslims? Exactly. Maybe it's because Hizbut Tahrir shares some extremist beliefs with the classical Mutazilites that Nawaz is subconsciously exaggerating the historic legacy of both fringe movements. Anyway, the Mutazilite heresy was only Al-Ashari's phase one. During his phase two, he reckoned he could best counter the Mutazilitism of his past conviction by employing their own philosophical tools against them. Hence, far from abandoning Kalam, he remained an advocate, just no longer one of the Mutazilite strain. But eventually, Al-Ashari reached the third and ultimate phase of his journey, earnestly seeking to align himself with Imam Ahmed in creed even whilst those who claimed his namesake after him never themselves made it beyond phase two. Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari would, would use Imam Ahmed as his foundation, in a sense, because Imam Ahmed was, was considered the Imam of Ahl al-Sunnah wal-Jama'ah. It's his laqab, because he had such an important role to play in protecting uh, Islam from the Mu'tazilites. He was honored with that. Indeed, in the introduction of his final work, Imam al-Ashiri wrote, Our speech with which we speak and our religion which we practice is to hold fast to the book of our Lord Allah and the sunnah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what has been narrated from the distinguished companions and their followers and the imams of the scholars of hadith and in that we are protected and to hold fast to what Ahmed bin Hanbal would say Allah radiate his face, raise his rank and reward him abundantly and those who oppose his speech are to be opposed, because he was the virtuous imam, the complete leader through whom Allah made clear the truth, and through whom misguidance was repelled, and the methodology clarified, and through whom was suppressed the innovation of the innovators, the aberrations of the deviants, and the doubts of the doubters. So may Allah have mercy upon him, this foremost imam, noble, mighty scholar, and one of great understanding. In short, Towards the end of the second century of Islam, a group of careless Muslims began to toy with Aristotelian metaphysics and the musings of other ancient Greeks. They reckoned that by recasting their religion in the mould of non-Muslim logic, they would give it a more secular rational basis. But alas, they woefully overestimated their own intellectual ability, whilst completely underestimating the miraculous potency of the revelation, the Quran and the Sunnah, to defend itself. Because no human mind can truly comprehend the divine, other than by accepting what he, glorified and exalted be he, chooses to reveal of his mighty and majestic self through his messengers. To quote the historian Duncan MacDonald's paraphrasing of Ibn Khaldun, Reason cannot grasp the nature of God, cannot weigh his unity, nor measure his qualities. God is unknowable, and we must accept what we are told about him by his prophets. Aristotle and his folk speculated as they did precisely because they had no revealed scripture to judge by and by which to hold their intellects to account. This is not the case of the Muslims, who are encouraged to challenge other nations for speculating about God without reference to revealed scripture. <laughs> What is the matter with you? How do you judge? Or have you a book through which you study? 
Clearly, the urge to adopt and then adapt Aristotle and friends from Islamic consumption smacks of an inferiority complex. Had it been that a truer knowledge of Allah and a more robust defense of his deen could be gained through appropriating philosophies extraneous to Islam, then this would have been obliged upon us by the Messenger of Allah himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As for the Asherites, whose creed compounded Aristotelian categories with the atomism of ancient Greek and Indian philosophical traditions, their project eventually did go mainstream, but not until the turn of the 11th century into the 12th. And like the earlier Mutazilite practitioners of Kalam who spawned them, the Asherites only achieved domination when they received palace backing. Specifically, when the renowned Asherite Mutakallim, Imam Jawaini, convinced the Nizam al-Mulk, who was the de facto ruler of the new Seljuk Empire that had usurped the power of the Abbasids, to make Asherism the doctrine of state. Through the institutionalized teaching of the works of Jawaini and his celebrated student, Imam Ghazali, Asherism thus succeeded Atharism throughout the Eastern Islamic lands. As for the West and the rest of the Islamic realm, Asherism was spread by both heretic and hero alike. The heretic being Ibn Tumart, a student of Ghazali's who spread Asherism in the Maghrib whilst declaring himself the awaited Mahdi of Islamic eschatology. And the hero being the legendary Salahuddin of the Crusades, who helped spread Asherism in Egypt and the Levant. So although Nawaz was correct when he stated in his co-authored dialogue with Harris that Asherism won for political reasons, not because of the strength of the arguments, his chronology and the characters that he credited for it were way off. Unsurprisingly, many a pioneer and proponent of Ilm al-Kalam eventually, like al-Ashari, tired of the mental gymnastics and retreated back to the safety of deriving their iman exclusively from revelation. Part of this surely is due to the frailties of human nature. When we are young, we are amazed with our own intelligence and are often eager to debate with others to prove ourselves and what we hold true to be true than the truth of the next man. But forcing the incomprehensible mysteries of the divine into the proverbial pottery of the polytheist philosophers will sooner or later cause the half-baked clay to crack. The highly influential Jawaini we spoke of earlier, kneeing his death, expressed deep regret for ever having indulged in Kalam, saying, I abandoned the people of Islam and their pure knowledge, and I plunged into the vast ocean, immersing myself in what the people of Islam forbade me from. All this was in seeking the truth, and I would flee in a bygone time from following the predecessors. And now I have returned from all of that to the word of truth. Upon you is the religion of the old men. The great polymath, Fakhruddin al-Razi, hailed by his followers as Sultan al mutakallimin the prince of the practitioners of Kalam, also appeared to jettison the Kalam-filled baggage of his earlier years. In his final will and testament, Razi lamented, I employed all the methods which dialectic and philosophy had provided, but I saw in them no benefit to equal the benefit I found in the mighty Qur'an, because it seeks the surrender of greatness and majesty in totality for Allah the Exalted, and prevents one from drowning in discrepancy and contradiction. And that is nothing but true knowledge, whereas the intellects of men, they fade away and decay in deep fjords and hidden approaches. Ibn Taymiyyah, the greatest iconoclast in the history of Islam, likened the Muslim theologian's pursuit of Greek philosophy to a cut of dried out camel meat atop a steep mountain, very difficult to get to and not worth the effort. Amongst his copious writings against the Mutakallimun, Ibn Taymiyyah remarks scathingly, They came with intelligence, but they did not come with integrity. They have been given acumen, but have not been given knowledge. They have been given hearing, sight and hearts. And then he quoted the ayah. But their hearing, their sight and their hearts did not benefit them in the slightest because they denied the revelations of Allah and so were encompassed by what they ridiculed. Clearly then, the reinterpretation of Islamic creed through the ill-fitting and distorting lens of Hellenic philosophy did nothing for Islam, certainly nothing good. So no, 
preserving the work of Aristotle should most certainly not appear somewhere near the top of the list. The Muslims arguing for the importance of Islamic civilization. As was noted by one of Imam Ahmed's teachers, the great scholar in his own right and founder of his own school of jurisprudence, Imam Shafi, ما جهل الناس ولا اختلفوا إلا لتركهم لسان العرب وميلهم إلى لسان أرسطو. The people did not become ignorant, and nor did they differ, except due to their forsaking the language of the Arabs and their inclining towards the language of Aristotle.